Through the years, we evolved to be more than just a bank. We became your partner. And even if the things we do today won't be the same tomorrow, our promise remains unchanged. To be a reliable partner that gives every business, every dreamer, and every home a chance to shape their own future. That's why we are evolving to make banking intuitive and accessible to you. As we move forward, we'll be with you through every step of the way, making sure that our solutions are easy to learn, convenient to use, and most importantly, safe and secure. We may not be seeing face to face nor shaking hands now, but know that you can trust us to continue empowering communities, families, and generations to come. We are more than just your bank. We are partners through changes. Partners through extraordinary times. Partners through generations. RCBC. Petro Energy Resources Corporation is one of the fast-growing companies in today's Philippine energy business. In 2018, Petro Energy was ranked third out of 26 Philippine companies and 320th out of 1,000 fastest-growing firms in the Asia-Pacific region as cited by London-based Financial Times. Petro Energy has evolved from an oil exploration and technical services company in 1989 into a petroleum production, renewable energy or RE development, and power generation company. In 2009, Petro Energy formed Petro Green Energy Corporation or PJEC as its renewable energy arm. PJEC is a shareholder in RE joint venture companies, the Maibarara Geothermal Incorporated or MGI, Petro Wind Energy Incorporated or PWE, and Petro Solar Corporation or PSC. Petro Energy's investment in RE has proven to be a fruitful decision for the company. In a span of five years, from 2014 to 2019, Petro Energy has put into the grid five power plants utilizing renewable, clean, and indigenous energy sources, a feat unmatched in the current Philippine power sector. Its investment portfolio includes 32 megawatts Maibarara Geothermal Power Project in Batangas, 36 megawatts Navas 1 Wind Power Project in Aklan, and 70 megawatt DC Tarlac Solar Power Project in Tarlac. In 2020, the company achieved another milestone with the completion of its first commercial and industrial rooftop solar project, the 140.8 kilowatt solar installation at Enrique Piyuchenko Building in Binondo, Manila. Our business growth has also enabled us to implement and sustain corporate social responsibility programs for our stakeholders and provide meaningful benefits to our employees. For more than 30 years, Petro Energy has gradually made the mark in the industry through awards and recognition from industry peers and by delivering on its promises. Profitable investment for shareholders, constant pursuit for growth while ensuring sustainable positive impact to our host communities and the environment. The 2020 Global Climate Risk Index ranked the Philippines as the fourth most vulnerable to climate change. Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation, or RCBC, is taking a leadership and constructive role to support the growth of sustainable finance and help reduce global warming. We believe in doing our part. Our sustainable finance strategy maps out our commitment to upholding environmental and social responsibility in all aspects of our business. Under our environmental and social management system, all loans undergo a vetting process. We believe in walking the talk. Aside from responsible lending, we have also taken important first steps to reduce our own carbon footprint as an organization. 
Our initiatives to lower our carbon footprint support our sustainable finance activities. Our initiatives also meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. In December 2020, RCBC announced it will no longer finance new coal-fired power projects in the Philippines. Our contribution towards a low-carbon and climate-resilient future is manifested in our various activities. The projects funded by our sustainability bond issuances have meaningful contribution to the communities and environment. Find out how we are building a better, more sustainable world at RCBC. Global spending on the transition to clean, low-carbon energy jumped 27% in 2021 to a record $755 billion driven by electric vehicles and renewable power sectors. The record-breaking numbers only show how strong investor appetite is for technologies and initiatives that will try to prevent the worst effects of global warming. Good day, everyone. My name is Mimi and I will be your host this afternoon. Welcome to RCBC's Forum on Sustainable Energy, Sustainability as a Shared Responsibility. I think we can all agree that there is a need to shift to sustainable renewable energy and soon. And this can only be achieved through a collective effort from investors, private companies, government, and independent organizations. Only then can we create viable solutions 
for the long-term health of the environment and society. In today's event, we hope to find out from our three panelists how they envision a sustainable future with renewable energy, what are being done towards that end, and how investors can power their portfolios with clean energy. Now, after the presentations, I will be joining the panelists for a group discussion, followed by a question and answer segment for the media. You may, however, already type your questions in the Q&A tab found at the bottom of your screens as we go along. Now, before we go any further, let's hear from the Chief Risk Officer and Risk Management Group Head of RCBC, Mr. Gabi Tomas. Mr. Tomas oversees the bank's strategy on various risks, including environmental and social or ENS risks and the corresponding development of sustainable finance to minimize such risks. The sustainable finance team within the risk management group spearheads the implementation of the bank's sustainability initiatives. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Juan Gabriel Tomas. Gabby? Thank you, Mimi. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the RCBC Sustainability Talk series. On behalf of RCBC, I would like to welcome all our partners, clients, friends, and industry colleagues who are joining us today. Indeed, RCBC has come a long way since we first took up the ESG challenge. It all started in 2011 when we established an environmental and social management system to evaluate and analyze projects from the ESG lens, something no other domestic bank was doing at the time. Fast forward a few years later, we implemented our sustainable finance framework in 2017, effectively inviting investors and capital markets to join us in funding and supporting projects with clear environmental and social benefits through our green and sustainable bonds. Today, our CBC remains at the forefront of ESG as we push forward investing in green and sustainable projects, as well as engaging various stakeholders in conversations that need to take place on the ground, very much like today's session, which will focus on the most, if not the most important pressing issue of our time, that backbone of our economic engine, energy, and how we can all responsibly transition and keep up with our developing economy's ever-growing demand in a sustainable manner. Sharing their insights on this today are Undersecretary Ripley Fentebella from the Department of Energy, Sir June Delphine, President of Petro Energy Resources Corporation, and Ms. Beth Coronel, Corporate Banking Group Head for RCBC. We will also be hearing key messages from RCBC's President and CEO, Mr. Eugene Acevedo, as well as Mr. Jean-Marc Arbogast, Philippine Country Manager of the International Finance Corporation. Indeed, it will be a very interesting session with our esteemed panel of experts, and I look forward to hearing their insights. So without further ado, I would like to open the event proper, and I'm inviting everyone to sit back and enjoy the discussion. Once again, welcome and good afternoon to all. Thank you for that, uh, Gabby. After hearing from their chief risk officer, let's now hear from RCBC's top honcho. Now, under its leadership, RCBC made major strides in sustainable finance, resulting in landmark green bond issues They've been given a double A ESG rating by Morgan Stanley Capital International. In December 2020, he made a very bold pronouncement that RCBC will no longer be financing new coal power projects in support of the country's moves towards clean energy. He also serves as chairman of the Asian Bankers Association, the president and chief executive officer of RCBC. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Eugene Acevedo. Thank you, Mimi. Thanks very much. Yusek Wimpy Fentabella from the Department of Energy, June Delphine from Petro Energy Resources Corporation, Jean Marc Arbogast, IFC Country Manager, dear clients, friends from the media, RCBC colleagues, good afternoon. In the past two years, the whole world had nothing on its mind but how to survive COVID. But the impact of the economic slowdown affected all industries, some to a greater extent more than others. But as we work to survive and to continue to address the needs of our clients, we were reminded that besides COVID, there were other pressing issues that needed to pay attention to. A call to be part of the net zero revolution had started. 
this will reach every corner of our economy and society and businesses need to, re to redouble efforts in order to reach net zero. And much more needs to be learned and understood about how sustainable finance can contribute to this. RCBC started on our sustainable journey more than 10 years ago. Since then, we have slowly adopted in our lending strategy and operations, the sustainable mindset. And a few days ago, we launched the fifth issuance in our series of ESG themed bonds. The, more, the most recent bond issuance takes our total aggregate ASEAN green and sustainability bonds to more than 55 billion pesos. The proceeds of which will be used to support asset growth, refinance maturing liabilities, and other general funding purposes in accordance with the bank's sustainable finance framework. This, on top of our recent introduction of green time deposits in our product lineup, underscores our deep commitment in contributing to the green goals of the country. But beyond the numbers, allow me to share with you the five lessons we learned in our adoption of our sustainable finance framework and how this has been embedded in our bank. Lesson one, we have been accustomed to aligning our businesses with international benchmarks. Since the time we subscribed to the IFC performance standards, we've been engaging leading third-party advisors like ING Bank and Sustainalytics to ensure that global definitions were followed in our green and sustainability bond issuances. Lesson two was walking the talk. We've been implementing our environmental and social risk management system or ESMS since 2011. Last 2019, we were able to formalize our sustainable finance framework, which became our guide in funding projects that promote sustainable development. And in 2020, we were the first local bank to publicly commit to cease funding the construction of new coal power plants. Lesson three, we had to cast a wider net. We serve multiple customer segments from conglomerates to SMEs, the underserved clients through our Discard Tech mobile app and value chain players in the agricultural sector through our microbank. And with this, we recognize that our investor base can be expanded. The oversubscription of our sustainability bond issuances is a testament to this. And we are optimistic that our impact investing clients will support our new peso green time deposit that is now out in the market. Lesson four was enlarging the ecosystem. The growing demand for sustainable finances prompted regulators and market participants to develop a uniform response such as reporting standards and banking regulations. Through our green and sustainability bond issuances, RCBC helped establish an early support for the BSP in the development, in the development of BSP Circular 1085, which mandates lenders to include environmental and social considerations in their governance frameworks, risk management systems, strategies, and operations. While our commitment to cease funding on coal is our answer to the Department of Energy's call to move towards cleaner energy. Lesson five, strengthening transparency and trust. Well ahead of the industry deadline, RCBC released its first sustainability and impact reports together with our annual report in 2019. This yearly practice has deepened the trust and strengthened our transparency to our clients and industry experts. And it doesn't stop there. We continue to develop our skills through, pioneer, through pioneering capacity building activities using the Paris Agreement Capital Transition Assessment or PACTA and related methodology developed by the Two Degree Investing Initiative, which was the first in Asia, and participation in the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, or PCAF, where RCBC is the first Philippine bank to join. 
These five lessons are just the start of our efforts to embed sustainable finance in our operations. In the end, we hope that these commitments contribute to the net zero revolution. But before I close, on a personal note, just before I came into the Zoom, I remember the time when as a physics major in university, I participated in a solar energy project which helped power the pumps, the water pumps for farmers in Cebu. That was in 1984. Now, solar is cheap and pervasive, and that makes a nerd like me happy. In the end, we hope that these commitments contribute to the net zero revolution. After all, sustainability is a shared responsibility. And doing good, as we always say, is not only good business, it is simply the right thing to do. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the discussion. Thank you for that, Mr. Eugene Acevedo. Very encouraging to know we've got a science guy leading a financial institution. As you mentioned, the future is bright and it's looking very green. Now, I think we're ready for our first presentation. Our first presenter will tell us about the country's current energy situation, the outlook, plans and programs, as well as investment requirements for the development of a renewable energy resources. He is Attorney Felix William Bukid Fuentebella, the current Undersecretary of the Department of Energy's Power, Renewable Energy Planning and Investment. His government career began as a political affairs officer from 1997 to year 2000. He was chief of staff from 2007 to 2010, around the time his father returned to Congress. He's also housing commissioner of the Housing and Land Use Regulatory Board in 2010 and Deputy Secretary General of the Housing and Urban Development Coordinating Council in 2011. He hails from Tigaon, Camarines Sur, where he served as congressman of the 4th District. As representative, he pursued bills including the Anti-Money Laundering Act, as well as amendments to the Procurement Act. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from UP, started his Bachelor of Laws in Ateneo, and finished it in San Sebastián de Coletos before passing the bar in 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Energy Undersecretary Felix William Wimpy Fuentebella. You said? Hi, thank you, Mimi. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a tough job because I have 15 minutes to cover around 40 slides. So if you don't mind, um, I sought the help of um, the Secretariat if we can already share the slides. Are we ready? Okay. So next slide, please. So um, thank you again, RCBC, for spearheading this event. Um, allow us to share the Philippine Energy Plan, which is that document that binds us together in our move for, towards the clean energy scenario. So we have five major outputs here in the presentation. And um, next slide. Yeah, next slide, please. I just want to go back to history so that we can have a better grasp of what the business as usual is like and where was it anchored from? It is anchored from our experience in the energy sector. Like for example, uh, Meralco was born in 1903. American investor came in, put up the wires and the power plants. Napocor also came in 1936. So during the American time, Napocor and Meralco. So we also see that there was a massive rural electrification in the mid-60s, covering the poblaciones. And after that, entering the 70s, the parity rights agreement matatapos na. So the American owners had to share, had to sell their Meralco business because it's a public utility. It should be. Filipino owned. So Lopez family comes in. Um, it's also the time that we also experienced energy um, challenges. That's why we explored no, um, looking into nuclear, uh, utilizing the atomic energy law, which was sponsored before in the 50s by the senators from the Liberal Party. Next slide. So 
Napo Core was was big, but it uh, became bigger um, while we were expanding. And to provide that energy system, which is the power bank to the wires and to your houses. So it's a power plant, wires, houses. We created the National Electrification Administration. So through these two giants, power bank making, transmission, and then distribution in the poblaciones, that was how we were able to energize most of the country. That's why we have a lot of electric cooperatives. And in implementing the atomic energy law um, and looking into nuclear, uh, other, other uses of nuclear, the peaceful use of nuclear was um, explored by the country through the Pataan Nuclear Power Plant. Now, um, you would notice that it was government mostly running the show, and some had public utilities that were granted franchises by the government, like Meralco and the other private-owned distribution utilities. Next slide. So Napocor was building plants, and then um, when Edsa won, by the way, it's February 25 soon, when Edsa won came in, um, we mothballed, the, the country mothballed or did not run the Bataan nuclear power plant. So we had to pay the debt, but we did not use the proceeds ng pera kung saan napunta. So that's a, that's a big issue where we lost also the arbitration case with the BNPP issue with Westinghouse. So it opened up yung, um, why is government here in the first place? Why not private eye? So yun yung nag We sought the help of the private sector and um, private sector sold us uh, energy, electricity. Sabi nila, yeah, we can provide you, for example, 100 megawatts. Um, you can pay for the 60 megawatts. Uh, even if you utilize 40 megawatts, you have to pay for the 60 minimum. So yun yung mga take or pay. So we had to go into that. And that's basically to cover up for the mothballing. Next slide. And also there were a lot of calamities that happened. So you had the earthquake, you had the eruption of Pinatubo. So that was how we, we entered no? the 90s. Next slide. So that's where um, the Electric Power Crisis Act came in, 1993, and then IPIRA in 2001, because you had to solve the financial problems of Napocor at the time. So um, the financial problem was not only brought about by our missteps or by the calamities, but also because of the financial crisis. Next slide. So the strategy of the country in the power sector was to get out of uh, the business, mostly. That's why PISOM is privatizing almost everything as far as the power sector is concerned. And now um, we also passed on the risk to the private sector. But it turns out that it would be like uh, parang a blessing because in IPIRA, we allowed the ownership or the consumers to produce their own electricity. And hindi natin na, na, nakikita na yon ng ibang uh, legislators at that time, pero hindi pa nakikita ng publiko. Na maraming technology kasi sa generation. That's why we had to um, deregulate generation and focus on transmission distribution regulation through the Energy Regulatory Commission. So that's for power. But for, for oil, um, what happened was when we had uh, a hybrid of um, government and uh, private going into the oil selling business, petroleum products, it was brought about by a series of events as well. So 1973, you had um, the oil crisis and there were um, 
investors, ESO um, and Phil Oil went out no? or, or opted out. Sold it to government. So government um, had to supervise the sale and distribution of the stocks of these two companies, which they merged together. And I think it's the birth of Petrofil that became Petron. Next slide. So um, we also privatized it because during that time of uh, the Cory Ramos administrations, um, the oil companies were asking, how can we compete with government? So that was what happened. No, To cut the long story short, we sold Petron so that it will be a um, private sector um, a private sector competition on the part of the private um, companies. So yun yung background natin. Why am I saying this? Because before we leapfrog towards the clean energy scenario, we have to have a, a firm foundation on why this is our system right now. Next slide. So even the oil price stabilization fund was removed. And why do we need the energy um, infrastructure and the DOE or, or overseeing things. The reason there is yeah, eight minutes, seven more minutes. The reason there is um, we also had a time the way we did not have the DOE. So, kaya nag, nag, nagpatong patong yung problems. Next slide. So, where are we now? Next slide. So, our situation as far as total primary energy. Uh, supply is, we have these figures 2018, 2019, and 2020. You see, yung sariling aden or indigenous, uh, pataas, yung importation. So we have renewables at one third, oil based at around one third, and coal fired and not gas at around one third. Next slide. <sighs> so the total uh, final energy consumption talks about the demand. So when we have the demand um, picture, we see kung sino yung mga customer natin. No? And ano yung ginagamit nila. So the household transport industry services and agriculture and on energy use of energy um, services and products is, are there. And then you have ano yung ginagamit. Okay. So that's how we look at total primary energy Supply, take TPS, and total final energy consumption. Why is, is it important, the supply and demand, to, to be understood by everyone? Because in the end, my energy balance table. Yan. So, parang accounting. Next slide. Focusing on power, this is electricity. This is the picture that we have. No? We have... Installed, ito yung kaya, no? 26,000 megawatts. And yung nag-generate niya in gigawatt hours is 100,000. So, where is RE? Yung installed natin is 29%, whereas yung gigawatt hours yung nagpo-produce niya, pag nagpo-produce na yung RE, is around 21%. So, coal... <coughs> is also their dominant uh, contribution contributor also. But uh, in that gas, you see, kahit maliit yung insult, yung uh, talabas niya or the produce is around 20%. Next slide. So how do we defrog? Next slide. So the PEP, as I said, is the document. Next slide. That basically provides the, the blueprint. And we have the anchors where we where we see ambition 2040 the nine point agenda and the sustainable development goals and focusing on the sustainable development goals sdg7 which is sustainable affordable energy supports all the other sdgs so that's important to to note next slide so what are our targets here is where we now put everything together no? the reference scenario or the business as usual anchored on our history and how we are set up na users pay 
and true cost. Yun yung major rules for energy. Users pay, like I use the energy, I pay. Luzon pays for the energy it uses. Mindanao pays for the energy it uses. Parang ganun siya. And true cost. So normally, it's, it's general rule, no subsidy. So from the reference scenario, you now add energy efficiency, renewable energy, other technologies, information communication technology, and resiliency. And it is uh, going towards the clean energy scenario, which provides us energy security, sustainability, resiliency, and competitiveness, utilizing ICTs. And the consumers are at the heart of it because in the end, the consumers are the ones that will pay or the, the ultimate investor in the energy sector is the consumer. No? Siya yung magbabayad ng lahat kasi pinapasoon dyan. So, next slide. So, by fuel, the total primary energy supply, this is uh, in Korean, uh, the energy, no? Makikita natin yung picture in a million tons of oil equivalent, no? Um, so you have 2040 um, reference scenario versus 2040 clean energy scenario. So pag nakita natin yung picture, if we do the formula, no, EE plus RE plus other energy technologies plus ICT and resiliency, you have self-sufficiency at 59%. So that is... Uh, how we are we are looking at uh, in utilizing our, our softwares kung paano natin makikita from 2020 to 2040 no kasi may mga issue nga na bakit kasi masyado tayong affected ng importation no so yung self sufficiency kasi natin baka mapabayaan so yan yung picture how we what are the, what's the difference between reference and clean energy scenario Next slide. So again, um, by sector, ano yung mak makikita natin no? from our behavioral uh, pattern ngayon? Um, ilan yung magiging share nila? No? In the reference scenario, next slide. So that's the reference scenario, next slide. <coughs> And how do we transition sa clean fuel? Makikita natin na it will really come out in the middle of 2020 to 2030. So, next slide. So, power generation by fuel, the reference scenario depicts that not gas is the dominant provider sa electricity. So it also has the capability to, to display some of the fuels like coal. Um, the reason why nat gas will be dominant here is because we have to transition. The transitioning here is, is significant because nat gas, um, as, as we speak, has the flexibility. Kasi yung R ibang pumasok, iba yung ano niya, iba yung behavior. Okay. So next slide. So that's where we are. Next slide. And how do we get there? Yeah, I explained already. Next, next slide. That the key here, are, um, aside from the, uh, aside from the, I uh, no, no, the the RE, we also have to look into the upstream, downstream, and the other other sectors because RE cannot do it alone. Next slide. So this is the RE implementation. Next slide. It cannot be alone, no? Uh, kailangan yung, yung NREP na to, National Renewable Energy Program, is already embodied in the Philippine Energy Plan. The targets are 35% share 2030 and 50% share by 2040. Next slide. So we do that, no? These are the details, how we accelerate our RE position. Next slide. We have the programs, no? RPS, that's quota buying from RE, from the distribution utilities, for example. <clears throat> we have the strengthened partnership with the RE developers. We have to have reliable infrastructure. Next slide. And we have to know where we placed the RE. 
So ito na lang yung sigurong take away natin in the last few slides. No? Um, yung potential natin sa offshore wind can power no? our demand seven times over. Next slide. So that's why it's important for us to know where it is. No? And uh, where it is, we should already prepare how the lines will be available. Next slide. So that's offshore wind. So we have here the smart grid, the flexibility needed for the power sector, and also the total electrification. Next slide. So for energy efficiency, for, uh, uh, for jobs, you focus on the implementation of the new law, RA11285. Next slide. We're also looking into, hyd looking into hydrogen, uh, use of uh, new nuclear, especially the small modular ones small modular reactors, next slide, and other alternatives no? like e vehicles, how to develop them, how to utilize them, especially so na ma mahal pa siya. So the bright spots in the e vehicle, no? um, I think there's already that uh, agreement na magkakaroon siya ng some incentives that uh, provide na lang ng DOE yung details. Next slide. But we also have to provide the support. So where we are going, we need to build no, our clean energy scenario infrastructure and support systems. Next slide. So just uh, remember that in going towards this, we have already the estimates of the required investments, which is around konti lang naman, 153 billion US dollars <coughs> in upstream, downstream, and power sector. Next slide. So next, I don't think, uh, I think I'll, I'll sige, na pa. Um, we just want to focus on that formula wherein we have the RE plus energy efficiency and the other energy technologies, resiliency and um, ICP because that's where the funding is needed. That's where, that's the key for us to, to jump towards the clean energy scenario. So <clears throat> that being the case, uh, the Department of Energy would like to thank everyone for listening and for this opportunity to present. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Undersecretary Wimpy Fuentabel. Yes, certainly a lot to think about. Uh, the development of renewable energy resources is a top priority for many parties, developers and generators, local government units, national government, and even lenders. For its part, the Petro Energy Resources Corporation, or PERC, continuously revisits its development strategies and supports government policies for further promotion of renewable energy in the Philippines. PERC is an affiliate of the Yuchenko Group of Companies and a publicly listed company here in the country with a portfolio encompassing upstream oil production, renewable energy development, and power generation. Our next presenter will take us further into the experience of PERC in renewable energy development. He is the company's vice president, who also sits as the president of the Maibarara Geothermal Inc. He also has a vast experience in YGC, PNUC EDC, UP National College of Public Administration and Governance, as well as the Geological Society of the Philippines. He is a geologist with a PhD in Public Policy and Administration from the University of Southern California. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Francisco Delphine Jr. June? Uh, thank you, uh, Mimi, for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, thanks as well to RCBC for the chance to speak today and a pleasant afternoon to all the attendees. My talk is about Petro Energy's experience and concerns as an RE developer. No? Though some elements of this story are of course unique to Petro Energy, such as our ongoing transition from an oil company to a green energy company, many other aspects of our experience, uh, I believe, reflect those of other RE investors as well. So I will share our story in uh, about 15 slides following the simple outline shown on the screen. I will start with some broad context, uh, but the bulk of my talk will be on the second and third topics where I, where I will describe uh, the development and the performance of our RE assets as well as highlight certain key experiences and concerns as a developer before closing with a brief uh, commentary. So next slide. 
Okay. Uh, so just a, a quick recap of where RE is in the current uh, country situation. Uh, this uh, slide summarizes uh, three decades of power generation from different fuel uh, sources for the entire country. It clearly shows, <coughs> excuse me, it clearly shows a uh, coal uh, predominance in the country's energy mix, accounting for nearly 60% of the total. And when you add Malampaya's input of about 20%, then fossil fuels supply almost 80% of our power uh, generation. And when you consider further that about 98% of our coal are imported, then you have to worry a little bit about the national energy security dimension of that much imported uh, fuel. No? Uh, even with the enactment of the RE law in 2008, Solar and wind didn't really uh, get going until about 2015, when the feed-in tariff supported power projects start contributing to the generation. And even so, uh, their contributions remain small. No? So together with hydro and geothermal, RE generation uh, make up only about 20% of our country's uh, generation mix. So clearly that's a very long way to go before we can uh, become a net zero society and underscoring that much, much work remains to, to be done, of course. No? So on Petro Energy's uh, part, uh, the company decided in 2008 to diversify and uh, gradually exit from our petroleum, upstream petroleum business. As you know, we have been in offshore Gabon, West Africa since 2002, uh, producing oil there. And in 2009, we started our own energy transition by incorporating uh, PetroGreen as our RE holding company. And because of our oil experience, it almost became logical that our first venture into RE will be geothermal because of the similarities in the skills and resources in finding petroleum and geothermal uh, resources. No? Now, our experience developing Maibarara through MGI starting from around 2010, in turn provided us with the corporate experience, uh, confidence and networks to later venture into wind energy, where we absolutely knew nothing about at the beginning. And of course, later on to solar as well. So to cut a long story short, from about 2014 to 2019, we put online to the grid uh, five individual power stations under these three different uh, SPVs. Uh, the total installed capacity is still somewhat modest, just under 140 uh, megawatts. Now. So going now to the specific projects, <clears throat> after the 2008 RE law, there was a rush of private investors in the country's geothermal industry, including uh, Petro Energy. No? And to accommodate this investor's exuberance, if you will, the DOE granted through competitive bidding in 2009 and 2010, 16 geothermal fields or areas to 13 different companies with the target of installing over 600 megawatts of new geothermal capacities. No? So that was in 2009 and 2010. So 10 to 12 years later, <clears throat> out of the 16 geothermal blocks granted to 13 different companies, only one of these, just one, exactly one, have become operational mm -hmm. and commercial. And of course, I'm referring to our uh, previous uh, slides. Of course, I'm referring to uh, Petro Energy's Maybarara geothermal power plant in Batangas. No? When we put up our uh, first unit, the 20 megawatt Maybarara one, in February of 2014, that was actually the first geothermal plant built and completed in Luzon in 16 years. No? Uh, four years later, we added our second uh, unit, the 12 megawatts, Maybarara uh, 2, 
Uh, within that same compact area shown on the on your screen, that's about seven to nine uh, hectares now. And a year before that, in 2017, MGI started providing dividends to our shareholders who are identified there on the upper left corner of your screen. And since then, since 2017, we have been able to provide consistent dividends to our shareholders. So next slide, on to our Navas uh, wind power project in Aklan. Uh, this remains uh, currently as the only wind power plant in Panay Island and is also the largest uh, power source in the entire province of Aklan, whether conventional uh, fossil fuel or renewable. And until recently, Nabas was also the highest perch wind farm in the country with wind uh, turbines erected at elevations of 300 to 500 meters above sea level in the foothills of Northern Aklan. No? So that setting actually impacted our civil works development costs, but it also provided the project with a great view of Boracay shown there on the background. And more importantly, high capacity factors for our uh, generation of the wind uh, turbines. We have uh, plans of uh, expanding this uh, project uh, to reach our original target of about uh, 50 uh, megawatts. But in the meantime, the operating company PetroWind has also provided uh, dividends to our uh, shareholders. Next slide. Uh, our uh, Tarlac Solar Power project currently consists of uh, two units. Uh, the first is a 50 megawatt uh, Tarlac one, which is uh, fit qualified that we put online to the grid in February of 2016. Uh, then the second unit, the 20 uh, megawatt Tarlac 2, we designed and constructed intentionally as a merchant solar plant after the suspension of the FIT uh, regime. We managed to start exporting power from that uh, merchant solar plant in the summer of 2019 coincident with the red and yellow alerts prevailing at the time for the Luzon grid by NGCP. Again, we have plans of uh, expanding our solar capacity here, but uh, like our geothermal and uh, wind asset, the operating company PetroSolar has been successful in providing annual dividends to our shareholders from 2018 onwards. Now, next slide. Now, going now to specific concerns, our first critical comment is nothing new. Permitting for new projects is simply time uh, consuming. No? And this is an observation already made by many others. No? In our case, we counted all the number of permits for individual uh, projects and including repertorial requirements, the number of permits in our case range from about 65 to 74. No? However, that number is actually lower than what some people claim are about 100 to 300 permits needed to start new projects. But I hasten to add that in our case, we just counted the number of permit document or title, but one permit can require anywhere from one to more than five signatures uh, per uh, government agency. Now, aside from that, I just like to point out two other aspects of the permitting process. One is that given this number of permits and more importantly, the time it takes for developers uh, to secure these permits and start projects going, it begs the fundamental question of whether our generation sector is currently and truly deregulated as EPIRA stipulated. Secondly, getting a secured permit, uh, especially from the local government units, of course, doesn't guarantee an obstacle or smooth free project development. No? Uh, that relates now to our second experience, which is dealing with the host communities. Uh, project proponents uh, to achieve seamless uh, project development must consider going beyond the formal rules of the consenting process and engage uh, and, and build and nurture 
and sustain social capital. No? In our case, in Petro Energy's case, we nurtured goodwill, trust, and reciprocity by collaborating and identifying projects that are truly appropriate and needed by the communities. In Tarlac, for instance, uh, to contribute to agrarian peace, we piloted and funded a chili, chili farming program for tenants or farmers in Hacienda Luisita. In May Barara, we concentrate on uh, community-based health and education, while in Navas, we integrated our environmental efforts with enhancing the ecotourism potential of the community. Next slide. Shifting now to our experience with respect to project uh, uh, funding, the scale and the cost of our projects are such that we have relied purely on local banks to provide us debt financing. Now, now, this doesn't mean that foreign lenders are not keen on our projects. In fact, for Maibarara, the IFC was one of the very first to offer us financing way back in 2010. Some of you may know Val Bagatsing, who used to be with IFC Hong Kong, and he was an ardent suitor to provide MGI with uh, debt financing for the project. But on the advice of our uh, financial advisor, we eventually opted to secure and go with the local uh, group of RCBC and DPI. Now, uh, with respect to our local lenders, our subsidiaries, and of course, Petro Energy, have been able to meet our loan covenants without any problem. So we presume that our local lenders find Petro Energy and our subsidiaries worthy and reliable clients. No? On, on our part, our main challenge with respect to local lenders are some requirements during the uh, financial closing and uh, initial drawdown stages no? uh, that are uh, somewhat complicated, some of which are shown on the screen, such as the need for land conversion for the site, the assignment of service contracts, and so on. Fortunately, we have worked with our lenders to fashion a, a reasonable compromise to these uh, issues. Okay. Now, of all the problems or challenges that we have experienced as an RE developer, we contend that nothing is more daunting and more frustrating than connecting your newly built plant to the grid to start the delivery of power. In other words, securing that much sought after certific certificate of compliance or COC from the ERC to start commercial operations as well as uh, secure the benefits that in here in that COC, such as the ITH, really requires a lot of uh, time, patience, and gritty determination from the developers. The problem has two uh, aspects to it. One is financial, because the developer has to fund the transmission connection, including the right of way acquisition, as well as some ancillary equipment. But the other problem, more intractable, is the overlapping authority of government agencies on technical matters and grid connection, particularly between NGCP and ERC. Next slide. There are other uh, significant barriers and concerns that uh, I need to mention very briefly. Uh, some of these include uh, the current rules that deter more private investments in the off-grid areas where power is obviously much, much more needed. Uh, things that add uh, further cost to developers like the cumbersome process of refunding VAT payments. Uh, natural disasters like Typhoon Odette that uh, destroyed and bound many transmission poles in the Visayas, resulting in widespread curtailment of plant output in Negros and in Panay. And more recently, ERC's determined imposition of the public offer requirements for GENCOS as a precondition for continuing commercial operations. Certainly, no one will quarrel with EPIRA's uh, 
mandate to widen the ownership base of the country's generation sector through this public offering requirement and ERC's mandate to, uh, to implement this, what we are merely raising is for some consideration on the timing and process for compliance, given that we are just emerging from the severe economic dislocations caused by the COVID uh, pandemic. Now, in the very short period that Petro Energy has operated as an RE company and as a power generating company, we are gratified that our performance and our projects have been recognized nationally and internationally by organizations such as the ASEAN Business Awards, London's Financial Times, among, uh, among others. So in closing, our uh, business uh, development approach anchored on careful project selections have led to healthy returns on individual projects. But at the same time, this has also limited the size of our portfolio to a modest capacity. There are many challenges in the whole uh, process of developing renewable energy, but in our experience, it is connecting the power plants to the grid that pose the most serious uh, bottleneck and requires the careful attention and review of our policy makers. We believe that our shared responsibility here is to make sure that all these power investments eventually lead to a lowering of the power rates to make our nation's economy competitive in the region, as well as to improve the lives of our countrymen. So uh, harnessing our uh, renewable energy involvement should no longer be a debate. National energy security, as well as uh, global climate concerns make it imperative. And Petro Energy is committed to this enterprise in two concrete ways. First, by supporting the DOE on policies that further promote RE, such as the coal moratorium, the, uh, the forthcoming green energy auction program and the like. And secondly, by Petro Energy increasing our own investments and footprint in the industry. We currently have a pipeline of mostly solar projects that will add about 100 megawatts to our portfolio in one or two years. And we intend to raise that by another 300 or 400 megawatts in three to five years time. So that's our story. Thank you for your attention and for your interest. Thank you so much for sharing the story of Kirk to all of us, June. We'll, we'll learn more about your plans, future plans later on. But first, we're ready for our next presenter who will talk to us about sustainable financing and renewable energy the evaluation process and considerations, and how RCBC has grown its portfolio of renewable energy, a portfolio that now includes a wind farm project in Vietnam that has been cited by the asset as the renewable energy deal of the year. That project was worth north of $100 million. She is RCBC's head of corporate banking group and first senior vice president, Ms. Elizabeth Coronel. Now, she has been with the Uchego Group of Companies flagship company since 2013, having started as the company's head of conglomerates and strategic corporate segment. Ms. Coronel has more than 29 years of experience in corporate banking, corporate finance, and consumer banking. She's currently the head of corporate banking group. Ms. Coronel graduated cum laude at USD with a Bachelor of Arts in Behavioral Science degree and earned her MBA units from Ateneo Graduate School of Business. She has completed courses in sustainable finance as well as the circular economy and sustainability strategies from the University of Cambridge and the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. She's now in an ongoing journey towards being a champion for sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Elizabeth Coronel. Beth? Thank you, Mimi. Um, good afternoon to our valued clients, our partners, friends from the public sector, friends from the media, my co-panelists, DOE Undersecretary Wimpy, Fuente Bella, Petro Green President June Delphine, RCBC President and CEO Eugene Acevedo, colleagues and friends. Thank you for being part of RCBC's very first sustainability forum. As Gabby mentioned a while ago, this is just the first of a series of sessions that we will be holding throughout the year. Sustainability as a concept is so broad that a two hour session is simply not enough to take up the essential items that will help you and me appreciate 
the relevance of these initiatives, not only to our respective functions at work, but as it applies to our personal lives as well. Today's session is focusing on sustainable energy as a shared responsibility. You heard USEC WIMP provide a comprehensive energy situationer. We also heard from a premier leader in renewable energy, Mr. Delphine. And in the spirit of shared responsibility, I'm chiming in to provide insights on how finance is a great enabler of sustainability. Um, next slide, please. But before we go into uh, energy, I just would like to touch on sustainable financing. Uh, this paper from the United Nations Environmental Program, Greening the Rules of the Game, defines sustainable finance as the financing of investments that provide environmental benefits in the broader context of environmentally sustainable development, i.e. green finance, as well as finance for education, social development, health, and other aspects of sustainable development, as defined by the 2030 Agenda, as well as the Sustainable Development Goals. So sustainability is really the bigger umbrella, which covers not just green financing targeted at the environment, but social as well, which should address issues in education, healthcare, poverty alleviation, and the like. Uh, next slide, please. Sustainable financing has long been an initiative of RCBC. As early as 2011, the bank has subscribed to the IFC performance standards. Uh, the IFC performance standards are an international benchmark for identifying and managing environmental and social risk, and it has been adopted by many organizations as a key component of their environmental and social risk management. For RCBC in particular, it has guided our implementation of our environmental and social management system, or the ESMS. This ESMS is a due diligence process which provides us provides a systematic way of identifying and assessing the type and scale of impact that a project may have on the environment and communities. It is embedded in our lending process as it requires all lending relationships or credits, both pipeline and portfolio, to be vetted from an environmental and social risk perspective. In 2019, we came up with a more comprehensive sustainable finance framework. And in 2020, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas released its version of the framework through Circular 1085. And as you know, in the same year, RCBC was the first Philippine Universal Bank to make a public pronouncement that we will no longer be funding new coal power plants. Next slide, please. Our sustainable portfolio, while largely composed of renewable energy assets, also include funding for energy efficiency, pollution prevention and control, clean transportation, uh, sustainable water management, education, affordable housing, healthcare, SMEs and cooperatives. Uh, next slide, please. Focusing on renewable energy, since 2012, we have supported approximately three gigawatts of renewable energy projects spanning across the various types, namely solar, wind, hydro, and geothermal. And currently, we are working on a pipeline of up to 1.6 gigawatts, which we hope to close in the next 12 to 24 months. Next slide, please. Here you will see the usual terms of our loans to RE projects. Note that most of these projects take on a project finance structure. We normally fund up to 70% of the project cost, the balance of which is taken up by the equity partners. The loan tenor can be as short as five years to as long as 15 years, and that includes a reasonable, pre-agreed grace period on the principal. It is priced based on a spread over an accepted benchmark which is reflective of market conditions. There will be a security package. I'll discuss that later in the next slides. And this, is a typical, and this is typical of project finance transactions. We also normally employ a team of independent advisors to provide essential inputs that go into our evaluation. The next slide will now show the key points that we look at when we fund our e-projects. So that's the sponsor or the project proponent, the viability of the project, the security package, a due diligence, which includes uh, social and environmental assessment, and the government and regulatory requirements. Let's move to the next slide for the details. The project proponent or the sponsor spearheads the project. This is important because they are our partners in this endeavor. We count on the sponsor to deliver a completed project. On project viability, we do a thorough evaluation of the off-taker the one who will purchase the power to be generated. 
lenders normally want a level of certainty of cash flow that will allow the project to service its debts. Lenders may not be prepared to fund a 100% merchant plan that is a plant without any power supply contract. Ideally, it has to be fully contracted, but we have been funding partially, partially contracted plants as long as the contracts are able to cover at the very least the break even. A security package will usually include all of the project assets, a pledge over the borrower shares, and varying degrees of sp sponsor support as needed. Earlier, uh, Mr. Delphine mentioned some challenges encountered in their projects, such as, uh, example, the DAR land, land conversion. This is in reference to land which is still classified as agricultural. And this is where the support of our friends in the public sector will be very useful, specifically in expediting the conversion process from agricultural to industrial. In a project finance transaction, there may be limited recourse to the sponsor, but typically it's mostly on the project itself. And because of that, the standard requirements of banks is for a perfected security package. Just the same, there may be ways to structure a transaction where some delivery of certain conditions may be delayed, and that can be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis. A thorough due diligence is conducted, assisted by the independent advisors covering technical, environmental, and social, legal, insurance, and we also employ a financial model auditor. You probably will ask uh, how long it takes to process a loan. And to give you an idea, depending on the complexity of the project, it can take from four to 12 months to reach financial closing, assuming that there are no issues that will surface as a result of the due diligence. Next slide, please. In all of these, I'd like to emphasize the need for a continuing collaboration amongst the players from the various sectors to make the project a success. And on a macro level, financial institutions see the need to support customers in the transition towards a sustainable economy. But we also look at our partners in the public sector who develop policies, legislation, regulations, and other interventions supporting this initiative. The next slide will show you uh, how our funding of various uh, renewable projects have been recognized by various award-giving bodies here and abroad. Uh, next slide, please. There. And on the next slide, um, next slide, please. In the 10 years or so that we have been funding renewable energy, it has always been in a solutions-driven manner because we know each project is different, each project is unique. We're able to arrive at different kinds of structures that are mutually acceptable and where risks and returns are equitably shared. We also work closely with our investment house, RCBC Capital, to deliver a fully funded proposal in case more funders are needed. So to emphasize, RE financing is really BAU to RCBC. As I mentioned earlier, we are working on a pipeline of various renewable projects of up to 1.6 gigawatts in capacity. And we continuously grow our pipeline as we intend to further support the greening of our country. The time to move is now. If we do not do anything, it will only get worse. The stakes are personal. We all feel the adverse effects of climate change. It is time to work on meeting our needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That is what sustainability is. After all, there is no planet B. And on that note, I end my presentation. Uh, on the next screen, you will see the contact details of the Renewable Energy Champions of the Bank. We would be happy to discuss your projects and plans to green the nation. Again, this is just the first. We will have more webinars that will talk about the different aspects of sustainability. Thank you, and over to you, Mimi. Thank you for that, uh, Beth. Very extensive report there. Uh, as you mentioned, there is no planet B. There is only one planet, so we can't get that wrong. So at this point, I would like to ask all of our presenters to please join me back again on screen for our panel discussion. Again, we're calling on RCBC Chief Risk Officer Gabi Tomas, uh, Energy USEC Felix William Wimpy Fontabella, PERC Vice President Mr. Francisco Delphine Jr., and of course, RCBC's Head of Corporate Banking Group and First Senior Vice President Ms. Elizabeth Coronel. All right. So I think we're all ready. Uh, before we proceed at this point, I'd like to remind our friends from the media to please type your questions in the Q&A tab found at the bottom portion of your screens. We will try to accommodate as many questions as we can, including 
possible questions from industry partners after our panel discussion with our presenters. So we have about 10 to 15 minutes for this uh, panel discussion. I wanna throw the first question to Beth of RCBC. Beth, let me start by asking you, in what ways did the pandemic affect financing activity for renewable energy projects in terms of data validation, assessment process, loan terms, rates, and payments? Thank you, Mimi. Um, the pandemic has made the process longer. Um, mm -hmm. as example, on the developer side, procuring the necessary permits was a challenge because of the community lockdowns and restrictions. Mm -hmm. And if their projects were in the middle of construction, we saw delays in completion because people got sick, foreign consultants weren't able to travel, and the like. So in these cases, we are open to discuss uh, with the client if there is a need to extend the loan or re-sculpt the amortizations. Mm -hmm. The same is true on our side. Uh, the due diligence process was also longer because our advisors were subjected to travel restrictions. So they cannot do the usual due diligence. Uh, some of them had to do table due diligence. But as the restrictions ease, the pending work has resumed. So um, it is now continuing. Uh, what the projects that we thought will close in 2020 or in 2021 obviously did not close. But we see that to be, uh, to be closing uh, maybe in the next 12 months or so. Mm -hmm. Beth, when it comes to interest rates in an environment where we're expecting a liftoff uh, by central banks, what is the outlook there? Oh, um, the interest rates right now have actually are still in the, um, well, how do I say it? The interest rates are, are steady as of now. Mm -hmm. uh, on the long term, on the long term, we're looking at it to, to increase a bit. But um, we actually, there's a lot of uncertainty because of the coming election. So mm -hmm. how normally how the, how the clients, how the customers want to price their loans is they want it long term. So we normally offer a fixed pricing or a floating pricing. It depends on it depends on how they how they look at the at the how they foresee the future, their um, their forecast of their of where the rates are going. Okay, thank you for that, Beth. Uh, this question is for June of Perk. June, would you describe your RE business and development approach as risk averse or conservative, given that your portfolio of less than one hundred forty megawatts as you yourself admitted, is small or modest? Uh, that's a fair question, uh, Mimi, and thank you for that. Yes, we admit our portfolio is, is modest, but I wouldn't necessarily equate our approach, on, especially on careful project selection, as being risk averse. No? Mm -hmm. And I'll give you two examples for that. Uh, the most recent is our decision to fund a merchant solar power plant right after the suspension of the feed-in tariff. Now, see, mm -hmm. so we went ahead and constructed a 20 megawatt uh, solar plant that was intentionally merchant at that point, even if during that time there were already many uh, solar plants that were stranded as a result of not being able to secure the feed-in tariff uh, allocation. No? So we, we funded the project on our own money. So in that sense, I don't think you can, <laughs> you can uh, consider that risk averse. No? The second example is on our geothermal uh, venture. You know, of course, that in comparison to other RE, the upfront cost of geothermal is, is very, very large. And that dissuades a lot of uh, other players from going into geothermal. So in our case, before we even managed to secure commerciality from the DOE and from our own lenders, we have to spend about 800 million of our own risk money to prove that the resource is worth uh, pursuing. No? So in that case, we're very careful, uh, but that doesn't necessarily, I would argue, translate to being risk averse for the company. Mm -hmm. June, less than 140 megawatts right now. Do you have a long-term goal, a target for RE capacity? Because your peers, and there are um, more of them coming into the space. Uh, one right. is looking to at 5,000 by 2025. Another one headed by a 28-year-old is developing a 500 megawatt solar project set to be the largest in Southeast Asia. Another one whose sponsored reach just went public is looking at 1.5 gigawatt over the next five years. What about PERC? Do you have a long-term yeah. vision, a target? Yeah, we do, but let me first state that the outset 
we never declared or we never claimed to wanting to be the biggest solar or the biggest wind energy company in the Philippines. We have always been driven by our goal of making sure that each project is be, uh, be, will become very profitable at the level of risk and capital that mm -hmm. our uh, that our principals are willing to bear. No? Mm -hmm. So uh, having said that context, we do have a long-term uh, vision uh, right now because everybody's just coming off from the uh, COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, uh, we're tempering the expansions. I've said we have target near term within one or two years of adding 100 megawatts mm -hmm. uh, 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 of new solar projects, and then about 300 uh, to 400 megawatts in the next three to four years. However, for the long term, <clears throat> uh, we are betting on offshore wind, mm. uh, not just for uh, uh, petro energy, but I guess for the uh, for the country because of the advantages uh, that offshore wind brings to uh, scaling up renewable energy generation. Obviously, they don't have the limitations on size and accessibility that uh, uh, large-scale solar uh, do. You also have more areas available for development than like geothermal. So we believe as, uh, and we support the DOE's action to uh, promote large-scale offshore wind development. And that is where we are betting our, uh, our long-term uh, uh, expansion. I'll ask you more details about that, June, later, um, because yeah, USEC sure. earlier said the offshore wind potential could meet demand seven times over. That's what he said earlier. Very big potential. USEC, Wimpy Fantabella, you've heard it. The private sector has spoken. They're all in. They're betting big on renewable energy. Given the existing pipeline that you know of, that we're seeing now, does it seem like you, the DOE's goal of sourcing 35% of our power from RE sources by 2030 and 50% by 2040. Does it look like we're going to hit that? Definitely. Uh, I think we will be able to hit that. But there are a lot of improvements and a lot of need for us to synergize because mm -hmm. I think you heard Simam Coronel keeps on saying it's contracts, contracts, contracts. We have to evaluate the contracts at least uh, reach break even. So that is what the Department of Energy has pushed for, for NGCP and the other distribution utilities to comply with their contracting requirements. Because um, we need them to contract kasi yung, yung wholesale electricity spot market, masyadong mababa yung uh, secondary price cap. Mm -hmm. So that's a deterrent for the, you also heard, no? yung merchant plans to come in. Mm -hmm. So that being the case, contracting is the key. At least protected in tayo sa volatility ng prices. Also, um, I think I have to emphasize that the EVOS law is already in place. So if there are permitting issues like uh, Sir June has been uh, repeatedly saying or uh, these are the challenges. Those were the challenges five years ago pa kasi meron na tayong EVOS. So I will give the number of Ms. Lisa Go, our investment promotion office. 0917-512-1234. Because uh, habang nag-uusap tayo, we were referring also uh, an applicant na mali naman yung sinabmit na uh, mm -hmm. mapping reference sa uh, application for a service contact. So those things, kaya ng investment promotion office yun. So, pag may problema sa DNR or sa DAR conversion or sa NGCP, kasama siya sa EVOS. So, yun yung mga pwede natin pag-usapan. And lastly, I just have to emphasize also that um, pero kasi yung mga alignments na dapat gawin with the international design for sustainable finance. And the good thing is, Mr. Yolando Velasco, one of the heads in the UN, United Nations Finance Com uh, Committee, I think, or department, is a Filipino. And he's very much willing to help us understand what is the meaning of incremental cost because sustainable financing does not cover the entire development. It only covers the incremental cost or yung pag shift mo towards RE, for example. So yun yung, um, ano yung GHG emission na, na, na displaced. Yun yung pwedeng tingnan 
ng kaya yun po yung bagong chapter sa Philippine Energy Plan na pinapropose namin na gawin for this year. Yung energy financing so that we can come together. And I think the NREB has a forum tomorrow with DBP and Land Bank of the Philippines to thresh all these out because we are moving towards the implementation of the green energy auction again to provide more contacts for 2,000 megawatts of RE. That's all it. All right. Thank you for that, uh, for the update, Yusek Wimpia. This question is for Gabby. Uh, Gabby, with an impending change of leadership in government, what do you think are the prospects for investments in the renewable energy sector in the Philippines? Is there anything else policy-wise, risk-wise that you think the government can address or can dangle to sweeten the deal for renewable energy investors. You know, whenever we think about RE, we look at Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, they're leading the way, uh, the energy transition in Asia, creating both policy and business environment to make it attractive for investors to get interested. What about for the Philippines? What else can be done? Well, first of all, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the nice things about our times now is that uh, sustainability is forefront of the global agenda. So I believe that whatever the government will, we will have after the elections, this agenda will be part of their directive, whoever the candidate wins. And uh, I'm always a firm believer in market forces. So I always like to encourage the carrot approach rather than the steak. Uh, it has to be something that comes from the market, comes from the grassroots for it to be sustainable, pun intended there. So uh, in terms of incentives, I've always pushed for uh, investment incentives for uh, financing through the capital markets. Also, probably the government can offer other incentives such as fiscal, fiscal uh, tax incentives for projects that have clear environmental benefits. I think that that is the way forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to also ask Beth, um, because Beth, you have... Uh, a clear vision as well as to how the investors, those taking out these loans for these projects are feeling, what, what, what's the sense that you're getting from them? What is the sentiment there with the leadership change? You mentioned how elections bring a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, actually, um, well, if this is also to follow up on Gabby's uh, point, no? we have laws already in place. So he, who, I think whoever wins will have to continue what the, you know, the laws mm -hmm. are there. And as Yusek Wimpy mentioned, uh, the key is really the policy rollout. The laws are there to, that will promulgate the country's transition to clean energy. And we're seeing a lot of activities, meaning a lot of interest, both in local and re from the local and regional players um, in the renewable energy sector. So I guess as long as those laws and the, pro the, the rollout of the policies uh, related to those laws are carried out properly, uh, the interest will continue to be there. Okay, thank you. This next question is for June of Perk. The DOE has endorsed your new offshore wind service contracts for grid impact study to NGCP. These offshore wind prospects are large capacity, as much as 1,000 to 2,000 megawatts per site. What made Perk go bold in that direction? And aren't you concerned about challenges of you know, developing such large projects when the rules have yet to be put in place for offshore wind? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so that, that's a fair question, Mimi. I guess uh, uh, there are two aspects to that. Uh, one of the rules, and fortunately, Yusek Wimpy is also here to speak a little bit about uh, rules being put in place for offshore wind. But in, in so far as, as uh, Petro Energy is concerned, uh, I, I think we are uh, uniquely positioned to uh, uh, invest and uh, uh, exploit this uh, opportunity mm -hmm. uh, because number one of our uh, involvement in offshore uh, energy operations in, in Gabon, uh, combine that with our experience in power uh, development. No? Mm -hmm. Now, not only is Petro Energy uh, uniquely positioned for uh, the future offshore wind industry, but I would add that the entire YGC group is in fact uh, well suited uh, for this opportunity. No? Uh, we have EEI, uh, who is uh, 
fairly well known for uh, large scale construction. Uh, and when you do offshore wind, uh, large scale offshore wind, you need technical skills and manpower. So we have Mapua University as part of our team. Uh, you need, of course, to uh, mitigate the risk. We have Malayan insurance to cover that. And of course, Beth and, and, and Gabby are here to join any, <laughs> any financing needed for such large scale capacity projects. Now, so uh, to quickly answer your questions, yes, we, we, we think we have the, the resources and the opportunities, not just within Petro Energy, but within the, the, the wider YGC group to profit from these long-term uh, investments. Now, now uh, are we worried about uh, betting big while the rules are still in place? Well, of course, that is always a risk, but I, uh, uh, both the private sector and the government through the DOE are working with the World Bank and uh, other international mm. donors to capture or, or to rather to fashion uh, rules to govern uh, this emerging market. No? It's, it's very important to get the institutions right uh, to make sure that the uh, private investments will be attracted. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly large scale offshore wind because of their uh, large capacity as well as their indigenous character uh, can really boost uh, the energy security of the country. You know? So uh, I was talking, you were talking about the rules and I've said uh, uh, it's, it's uh, fortuitous that uh, Petro Energy as well as the DOE actually sit as members of the steering committee of a joint industry platform that will fashion the rules uh, as well as remove obstacles to future development and offshore wind. We are a member and uh, USEC WIMP actually sits as the chair of that steering committee for fashioning uh, the rules for this emerging uh, industry. Now, Thank you for connecting the dots for us, June. Sure. Really very big potential. I know that the DOE has partnered with the World Bank Group as well to create the offshore wind roadmap. And one of the co-leads there, Mark Laburn, said the Philippines has over 170 gigawatts of offshore wind potential. Imagine how massive that is. On the topic of the offshore wind, I'm just going to jump right in because there is a question from one of our media friends, and I want it's connected already. I want to post it to you now. Based on... The documents from DOE, this is for you, June. Uh, you are looking at large offshore wind projects. Can you elaborate uh, the investments on the investments for these three projects and the timeline, including project rationale? Well, as I've said, I think I've spoken a little bit about project uh, rationale. Uh, there are advantages to offshore, okay. uh, large scale offshore wind that we do not get from, say, uh, onshore solar or even uh, geothermal. Uh, that's, that's one rationale. The other rationale is that the company and the wider YGC group has the resources and the, uh, uh, and the experience to profit from this long mm -hmm. uh, uh, emerging, uh, emerging industry. Now, as for the timeline, as, as you say, Queen Peak can also uh, attest, this is a this is a long term process. The the rules are still uh, the, the rules are still being uh, put in place. But in general, for offshore wind, private companies have about five years of pre feasibility uh, uh, stage to undertake all the necessary technical and uh, commercial studies before uh, deciding whether to go on the full uh, uh, scale construction and development. No? So on that note, locally, uh, you have that five-year window in which mm -hmm. to do your project. Secondly, it's also necessary to wait for uh, advances in technology on offshore wind that will make the cost, the capital cost of offshore wind much more competitive in, in the Philippines. Certainly offshore wind is competitive now in Europe, uh, in, in, in the US and, and parts of Asia, but they are not yet competitive at this point in the Philippines. So we have that opportunity, that window in which both the rules are to be set in place, mm -hmm. the pre-feasibility period, as well as the time for uh, technology improvement to make the capital cost of offshore wind turbines much more competitive in our country. Mm -hmm. Jun, taking off from your answer, what is the capital cost here in the Philippines compared to right, other countries? Right, is right it now, a what no, multiply no, effect? Well, right now, uh, maybe there's no capital cost yet because no one's building. No one's doing. Is there an uh, estimate? Yeah. 
Well, right now in the international market, uh, it, it, has, it has lowered to about uh, three to four million US dollars uh, per megawatt. Mm. Uh, Bloomberg Finance uh, predicts that that will uh, further reduce over the next five to 10 years. So it, it's not too, uh, it's too early to make uh, actual cost comparison in the Philippines. So, you know, we, we, we wait for, as I've said, this, these technological improvements to lower the the lower the cost, no, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, as as they are relevant to the Philippine setting. And for those who are very interested here, June, can you tell us where the sites are for the three uh, projects? Sure, uh, this has been revealed by mm-hmm. uh, previous uh, news items. I know there's our one in Palawan. Off- right, uh, our offshore wind sites are in northern. One is in northern Luzon. Okay. One is in northern Mindoro, and okay. the, the other one is eastern Panay. So that's ah, not okay. that it's already uh, okay. revealed by uh, previous uh, newspaper uh, reports. And one more question from Elena uh, yes. Flores here. Will Petro Energy seek partners for the said offshore wind projects, given the cost and the size? Yes, uh, certainly that's, uh, that's in the plan. These yeah. are large-scale, uh, very expensive uh, projects. Uh, not only that, you need partners who have the uh, corporate experience and the technical know-how to contribute to these uh, enterprises. No? So yes, we are definitely considering other partners in the, uh, in the future for offshore wind. Thank you, June. Uh, Beth, uh, here is one question for you. Uh, June earlier talked about uh, you know, partnerships so working together with the World Bank. Uh, speaking of the World Bank, their sister organization, IFC, is your partner in many of these initiatives for RE. How has the partnership helped you in RCBC in your role as a financial intermediary in promoting sustainability? Um, you know, IFC's guidance uh, basically aids us in our capacity building activities. We're also able to access global tools on climate risk analysis that mm-hmm. were not previously tapped in the country. So it all helps in our carrying out of our ESG initiatives. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, here's for USEC Fuentabella. Aside from lenders, developers, policymakers, private sector, who else should share the responsibility of pushing for this green ambition? You know, renewable energy at the forefront. Who else should be helping and how can they participate? You said? Everyone. Okay. Everyone. Everyone. Okay. Yeah. Like so me, how can I earlier, participate? For you, um, for example, when you wake up in the morning, you have to ex- ex- already... Um, ex- exercise uh, energy efficiency. And then when you want to improve your housing, your, your home, especially maraming ginawa yan during the pandemic, you have to ensure that energy efficiency designs are, are in place. When you purchase your bulbs, LED, mm-hmm. etc. When you purchase your appliances, look at the, the yellow markings, uh, the, the energy efficiency re- rating. So those are for every consumer. Now, for a bigger scale, you can go renewable energy producer for net metering in your office. You can be the energy manager for energy efficiency, or you can also encourage green energy option for them to buy RE on the demand side. And then um, the, on the larger scale, um, yun na yung mga ginagawa nila Sir June developer mm-hmm. na sila ma'am um, Beth mag-ano na sila mag-pautang uh, okay. so ganun po yung pa- palaki siya ng palaki so clearly there's no excuse we're all in this together this green ambition is all of our ambition uh, here's another question for Gabby uh, Gabby Tomas of RCBC uh, end of 2020 the president of RCBC Mr. Acevedo said no more coal no more coal quote I'll say that slowly no more coal he became the first banking CEO to make such a bold announcement following of course the coal moratorium declaration from the DOE Gabby can you tell us what percentage of the loan portfolio now is coal and since you won't be accepting new ones what opportunities or partnerships will you be leveraging to sustain business growth? Well, um, when our president made that statement, you know, it, it was uh, quite surprising for a lot of people. But uh, given our long-term commitment 
to sustainability, it was no surprise. Mm -hmm. Really helped us, pointed us in the right direction, uh, strategically as well. Um, in terms of the share of the portfolio, it's uh, it's uh, quite small now, um, and it's reducing because of that pronouncement. Uh, going forward, we are definitely looking for a lot of more renewable, renewable sources. That's what we're pushing for. And in doing so, we're seeing a lot of the peripheral issues, if you will, uh, with the local uh, projects. So uh, that is a challenge, but uh, that's a challenge we, we knew was there and we're happy to, to meet it head on. Uh, we will push forward. And that really is the strategic uh, direction we're going at right now. More pronounced, actually. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, uh, yes, Beth. If I can, if I can Go ahead. add, no. Um, yes, we we stop funding new coal power plants, but you see, sustainability in general offers a huge opportunity for business growth. Uh, you know, the ones who had the uh, coal power plants, most of them are putting up their own renewable energy power plants. Mm. So we're there, and the opportunities uh, are not just RE, but as mentioned, other areas like energy efficiency, healthcare water and others. So as the awareness increases, we are ready to sit down with the clients and discuss the new funding requirements mm -hmm. uh, brought about by the sustainability initiatives. Beth, would you, this is the final question from my end. Beth, would you say that your client bank relationships when it comes to ESG related opportunities have matured? Are your clients demanding the ESG aspect for their investments? Are we there yet? Okay, um, this is my take. ESG awareness is evident on the large corporations and conglomerates. Um, all conglomerates have their own ESG initiatives. Where, we, where I think we need to further beef up awareness is on the small and micro enterprises, which make up over 95% of the establishments in the country. At a certain point, when the big corporations fully implement their ESG plans, they may require their respective supply chains to be ESG compliant. And mm -hmm. remember, their supply chains are the small and micro enterprises. So it will really be a collaboration of all players to provide sufficient awareness and lead them towards a sustainable way of doing business so they can continue to be competitive. So that's mm -hmm. where the need is, the awareness. But for the big companies, uh, the awareness is already there. All right. This discussion is truly enlightening. Thank you to our distinguished members of the panel. I'm sure my colleagues in the media have a lot of questions for you guys. We will try to cover as many questions as we can within the time allotted for this segment, which is 15 minutes. So let's start with the first question. Some of them are answered already, so we'll just go over those that have not been addressed. This is from Mirna Velasco. Uh, is RCBC willing to fund renewable energy projects on a merchant basis? No PSAs, given that the Development Bank of the Philippines already made pronouncements on it that it is willing to lend to projects without PSAs. What are the conditions you usually enforce for new power projects, primarily RE and gas? Okay, uh, when we started funding renewable energy projects, uh, the requirement was like it, was, it has to be fully contracted, so 100% contract. Then we had the feed-in tariff scheme. Uh, but a couple of years back, we started funding partially contracted. As to fully merchant plants, I'm not saying it is impossible. It may be possible as long as we're able to address all the risks. So in short, let's talk and see and see how we can arrive at a mutually acceptable structure. Because uh, there are risks that uh, we believe has to be shared uh, amongst the various players in the transaction. All right. Uh, this is another question from Elena Flores. Uh, this is for June. June, for Perk, is there a possible Maibarara expansion? Uh, yes, uh, there is. Uh, but in terms of uh, priority, our uh, geothermal uh, expansion in Maibarara will uh, take a backseat towards the expansion of our existing solar and uh, wind uh, projects. Mm. Uh, that's partly uh, dictated by cost consideration uh, as well as uh, offtake uh, opportunities. But yes, we, we do have plans of, of expanding the Ibarara geothermal uh, further. But by how much? Uh, what kind of expansion? What's the size and what's uh, the timeline? Again we're, again, we're being conservative. We're looking at uh, anywhere between 10 to 30 uh, megawatt uh, okay. uh, expansion. But uh, the, 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 we need to do more studies to pinpoint the actual uh, uh, size no, 
of the uh, expansion or the Maibarara Tree project. All but right. that's the range. But that's the range that we're looking. At. And and you plan to do the expansion over the next one to two years? Not not the the one to two years expansion will be focused on our wind, wind and, and our solar, oh, okay. uh, especially based on the. Uh, existing service contracts that we have with the DOE plus new new contracts that we have been recently uh, getting into. So the geothermal expansion will probably go beyond uh, uh, the second. Uh, uh, so it will be in that in that uh, 300 to 400 megawatt uh, target. Okay. All right. Thank you, June, for that. Here's another question from uh, this one is from Nisho Precision Marvin. Uh, I think this is for USEC Wimpy. How to apply uh, for green energy option program? For the green yeah. energy option <clears throat> program. Same answer. Investment promotion office number zero nine one seven five one two one two three zero one two three four. We can guide you. <laughs> okay. All right. Is there a website that they can visit USEC for initial information before making that call? Yeah, it's uh, it's not really a call. You can you, you already Viber us. Ah, okay. Exactly. All right. Yeah. We have the number. Uh, here's another question from Elena as well. Uh, can you give more details about the 1.6 gigawatt financing being arranged by RCBC? What type of investments are these, Miss Beth? Um, it's mostly it's mostly solar. Okay. We have some wind and some hydro, but in but the majority is solar. Okay. Majority solar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, here is a question from Engelbert Tataro for RCBC as well. In your 10 years of funding renewable energy projects, how many projects have you actually approved? And also the total capacity, if you have data, total peso amount also for the last 10 years. Uh, they, you also offer green bonds to be used only in RE projects, right? Um. On the on the on what we approved, I believe I mentioned earlier that we supported around three gigawatts of um, renewable energy powers across all the all the four types: solar, mm -hmm. wind, hydro, and geothermal. I just don't have the amount with me. I can you know I can get back uh, to the one who asked the question so we we can provide uh, that wow. information. All right. Here is a question from Doris Dumlao. For the 1.6 gigawatt RE pipeline in the next 12 to 24 months, what types of RE technology will these mostly comprise? It's mostly solar. solar. Mostly, mostly solar. solar. Yes. Okay. Do, do we have an idea how many percent solar, how many percent, um, how many percent wind? Okay. Let me. Uh, it's about 70 percent solar. Seven. Okay. That much. Okay. That big. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that. Thank you for that, Beth. Um, how about this? This is for Yusek, Wimpy, and uh, anybody, uh, maybe uh, June. How concerned is the energy sector over the worsening oil crisis? Oil prices are jumping. How worried are you, Yusek? As far as the prices are concerned, it's going up. But as far as the supply is concerned, it's there. Mm -hmm. So it's more of how do we um, go about with our business? na mas hindi tayo masyadong gagastos for for additional costs. So that's where energy efficiency campaign comes in again. Mm -hmm. Like I usually I I compare my 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 behavior to the others in the office. I ride a Mio um motorcycle 125i. So my full tank is 200 pesos a week and it's 800 pesos a month. Compared to them their full tank is around 2000 a week. So, mm -hmm. yun yung mga sinasabi, um, carpooling, etc. But, work from home. So, those are the things that we, we really, whether the prices are going up or down, it's really energy efficiency should be practiced para hindi siya sayang. Mm -hmm. So, yung na natin na nangyayari sa labas, prices will go up, but yung na ng downstream oil industry namin, uh, management bureau, the supply is there. So it's it's okay. not really that kumbaga hindi ka masyado mag-aalala because of that. But but you said when, when you look at how many, you know, pump prices have been going up for at least eight consecutive weeks, that's that's yeah. a big problem for motorists, for taxi drivers. It is. I'm not saying it's not. But the problem there kasi is we passed on the risk to the private sector and it's it's not owned by the government. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So, what is your so, base case, Yusek, for oil prices? Are we gonna revisit, uh, you know, north of one hundred dollars per barrel again, back to twenty fourteen levels? That's gonna maybe. be a big problem. Maybe. Maybe I'm not sure, and I I cannot okay. see. I I. We, Mahirap i-predict kasi kung ma-predict ko yan, yaman ko na. Um, <laughs> okay. Hindi, hindi, hindi talaga siya kayang i-predict. No? Mm-hmm. Um, day-to-day siya nagbabago. Mm-hmm. But um, sa akin kasi, um, yung fundamentals naman, hindi naman talaga kasi dapat tumaas ng ganong kalaki. It's just that there is this um, geopolitical um, concern that's going on. All so right. that, that event is the one that's triggering it. And I don't think that event will be there for a long time. Mm-hmm. So magfi-fizzle out. So the dimension mag adjust again. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's it's difficult, no? I cannot say it's going up or down. Uh, okay. Thank you for that. I use How about June? From from your perspective, uh, are you worried about the worsening oil crisis and also aside from, you know, the oil crisis over the geopolitical tensions in Eastern Europe, I wanted to get your take because we're having this forum, this webinar series against the backdrop of an energy crisis felt all over the world. I mean, Europe is seeing energy prices spike and they're blaming the rush to RE. Uh, There weren't enough investments done for the usual traditional fossil fuel, um, but RE is not keeping up. It's not moving fast enough. That's why the gap there is causing the spike. So so what is your uh, take on this? Yeah, well, well, first of all, with respect to your first question about being concerned about rising oil prices, certainly, and of course, we, we agree with you, Sek Wimpy, that that concern is really more uh, pressing for ordinary citizens, right, to mm-hmm. the extent that they impact, you know, uh, prices of goods, uh, you know, transportation, and, and so on. So it's really worrisome. So last night, uh, Brent reached uh, $99 uh, dollars per, per yeah. barrel. So we haven't seen that kind of pricing since, as you correctly pointed out, in, in 2014. 14. Uh, and so uh, the lesson there, I guess, is that, you know, uh, things will not always uh, stay that, that, that high. There will always be developments that will uh, sort of temper this down. How long that will take, of course, nobody, nobody knows. No? Now, uh, it's a little thin argument for me to say that the investments in RE uh, are causing the, the uh, instability in, in, uh, in oil prices. Uh, I don't think there's uh, a, a case to be made based on, on hard evidence uh, uh, for that. But what this uh, crisis really uh, shows to us, at least in the Philippines, is to really harness all our indigenous energy mm. resources, you know, whether they're uh, oil or, or renewables. No? Uh, and, and even if you expand into, say, uh, LNG, which of course is a reasonable option, you know, one, one cargo getting stuck in the Suez Canal will trigger a, a chain of, 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 of events that will uh, increase uh, uh, prices. No? So there's no, there's no uh, excuse for not fully harnessing our indigenous uh, energy resource uh, endowment. No? And so we, mm-hmm. we support the DOE and the private sector, the bank's uh, uh, efforts on that, on that regard. Okay. Thank you for that, June. Uh, final question for Yusek Wimpy uh, from one of our media friends. Is the ERC considering making adjustments in its rule to require renewable energy companies to undertake a public offering given that many RE companies are constrained from doing a public offering because of the PSC's chain listing rule? Yusek? Uh, Yusek, uh, audio? So I'm not here to speak on behalf of the Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, I okay. can refer you to Commissioner Resi, the spokesperson. I hope they do, but uh, it's more of a consultation that's required. But I can give the number of Resi. Okay. But I will not but, publish or, or, or yeah. give it out in the public. <laughs> but, 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 but you're saying they should consider adjusting. No, I think they should hold the consultations because in the end, it's, it's, it's how... Mas marami kasing dapat tingnan aside from that. Eh. So anyway, mag-usap-usap na lang sila. Okay, on that note. <laughs> thank you, Yusek. I want to close uh, this discussion with one final question. Uh, one question thrown to all of our panelists uh, to close it, uh, answerable by a word. 
by one word. You know, betting on clean energy or the green ambition will require a lot of long-term visions because many times the opportunities are not obvious today. You know, as they say in investing, you want to go where the ball's going to be, not where the ball is right now. So you think about it in terms of what the energy landscape is going to look like three, five, ten years down the road. Could you give me a one-word description of where you think RE, renewable energy landscape, will be five years from now? Just one word. Where are you? Where are we in RE? So let's start with a USEC, uh, June, Gabby, and of course, Beth. USEC? One word. It's, it's un unstoppable. <laughs> RE will be there. Yeah. All right, June. Like the cell phone, yeah. you remember the cell phone, yeah. the technology, you can't stop mm -hmm. it. There's no stopping. Unstoppable, June? Well, five years uh, on that horizon. Well, my one word would be solar. Solar. Gabby? I think my keyword would be collaboration. Beth? I think my keyword would be bright, as in the prospects are really bright. There you go. Unstoppable, solar, collaboration, and bright. The future is looking bright and looking green. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this interesting discussion. Thank you, uh, Yusek, June, Gabby, and Beth. At this point, we would like to hear from the country manager of the Philippine Office of the International Finance Corporation, Mr. Jean-Marc Achboga for the closing remarks. Now, before joining IFC, Mr. Achboga was an investment banker at the Bank of America, Mary Lynch in New York City, advising global industrial and agribusiness companies on mergers and acquisitions and capital markets transactions. He holds an MBA from Yale University and a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from a French engineering school and SICA. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jean-Marc Achboga. Thank you, Mimi. Um... And good afternoon, everyone, and, and thanks for the opportunity to give closing remarks. Uh, I think over the past two hours, uh, we've had an excellent and thought-provoking discussion on the opportunities and challenges in, in the energy sector uh, in the Philippines. There is uh, no doubt left that there is a huge challenge um, in transitioning to a sustainable world and, and that it will be costly. And so we've heard from our distinguished speakers about potential solutions, which include renewable energy, such as solar PV, offshore wind, which I thought was very uh, interesting, um, and hydro. We heard about energy efficiency, and all of us uh, need to practice it. I think I got that message very clearly. And also new sources of energy, such as uh, hydrogen and, um, and uh, nuclear was mentioned. We also heard about some of the bottlenecks today uh, to scale up these solutions, uh, including technical uh, bottlenecks, for example, on the grid connectivity or on the lengthy uh, permitting processes for new renewable energy projects. But uh, rest assured, our colleagues who are all present here today in various organizations are working very, very hard to uh, alleviate these challenges. And now, uh, allow me to share what to me are three important takeaways and potential way forward. Uh, first takeaway is that we really need to mainstream sustainable finance. As our mm -hmm. friends uh, from DOE have just mentioned, the required uh, investments on renewable energy projects alone uh, will total almost $100 billion if we want to achieve the goal of having at least 50% renewable energy share in the power generation mix by 2040, $100 billion. That's not small change. So we need what we call a whole of financial sector approach to meet these, to meet these uh, very large requirements uh, on the country's green energy transition. And how can we do this? So we can do it by leveraging capital markets and innovative instruments such as sustainability linked uh, and green bonds that can expand the market, cut funding costs for uh, climate minded uh, companies, and of course, reduce uh, carbon uh, emissions. We can also use blended and concessional finance, which uh, to us is very important, uh, which play a critical role to reduce early stage and technological risks, which are uh, of course significant uh, impediment uh, to decarbonization. Now, banks also have a very critical role to play in, in promoting impactful and sustainable investments. 
And in the end, you know, we can all do our parts. For example, at IFC, we now have a new partnership program, which uh, called Scale Up Climate Finance through Greening the Financial Sector, or 30 by 30 zero. And 30 by 30 zero in the Philippines aims to harness uh, the private financial uh, sector to scale up uh, private sector financing for climate mitigation and adapt uh, adaptation uh, in line with the Philippines uh, nationally determined contributions or NDCs targets. Now, that was the first takeaway. The second takeaway uh, that I wanna mention is, and we heard it uh, previously, is that public and private sector collaboration is key. So on the one hand, we think the private sector will be typically more efficient, more cost-effective, can deliver a lot of innovative solutions. Uh, it can scale those projects uh, commercially, you know, very quickly. We, and on our side, uh, IFC, we've seen that uh, in the renewable energy and green building sectors, uh, including in our program, which is called IFC Scaling Solar, that delivers uh, solar PV to countries across Africa, but also closer to here in the Philippines, we have our EDGE building certification program that helps developers reduce their building's energy and water consumption. Um, so talking about energy efficiency and conservation. Uh, the private sector, of course, is also key because it's, it's the one that creates jobs and, and uh, we believe in a whole new era of uh, skills, new skills will be needed um, in this transition to, to a greener uh, energy future. Uh, on the other hand, we need significant government action, as we heard also, that creates the necessary regulatory and institutional framework to foster that innovation and those green investments. Uh, governments can calibrate policies to provide incentives or counter disincentives. They can set quality and technical standards, support skills, training and development, adjust uh, spatial and urban planning, and of course, invest in research and information platforms. Uh, so that was my second takeaway. Now, finally, my last takeaway is just the urgency of it, the urgency of working together to build back better. I think um, I've heard before there's no planet B. I think it's very true and, uh, and, and time is, uh, is, going, is going very quickly on that. We need to double our efforts uh, if we want a low carbon uh, future. And I think COVID has actually created an opportunity and we are at this critical juncture where we really have a chance to create significant headway towards a green, inclusive and resilient recovery. Um, at IFC, we have put climate at the heart of our development agenda. And we also just recently committed to align 85% of our board approved real sector operations to Paris Agreement goals by uh, July 2023, which we plan to increase to 100% by July 2025. Now, uh, before closing, I would like to specifically thank RCBC uh, under the leadership of Eugene Acevedo for all your work on the sustainability agenda. It's really quite remarkable uh, what you've done and achieved so far. So congratulations on that. And uh, in closing, I'd like to thank RCBC, our speakers and participants uh, today for sharing their uh, climate journey and green energy transition journey. Uh, we believe the businesses, companies, government leaders who embrace climate as a business opportunity and offer uh, low carbon technologies, goods and services will be at the front uh, or front runners of our future. Sustainability is a shared responsibility uh, energy efficiency needs to be practiced by all of us. So thank you again and pleasant afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jean-Marc Ahmoga. At this point, we'd like to ask all of the speakers and panelists to please turn on your cameras. We will do a group photo opportunity and flash your best, brightest smile. Uh, again, all our speakers, please turn on your cameras. Yusek Wimpy, uh, Mr. Acevedo, Gabby, of course, uh, June, Beth. Okay, is everybody here? All right, we're still adding everyone in. All right, so let me uh, do the countdown uh, at the count of three. Say green. One, <laughs> two, three, green. All right, let's do one more safety shot. 
One, two, three, say green. All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm afraid that is all the time that we have. On behalf of RCBC and the Uchenko Group of Companies, I want to thank our distinguished panel for sharing their presentations with us. Thank you as well to my colleagues from the media for participating in this afternoon's forum. Good afternoon and stay safe. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh,